Good morning and happy Sabbath! We are very happy that you decided to worship with us today. Our Sabbath school service will start at 9.30 and then our services will continue at 11 o'clock with the Divine Service. Remain with us. The Sabbath school will start shortly. Good morning, happy Sabbath. It is a blessing to be able again to open the Word together, to learn more about the character of God and um, spend some time with Jesus. Today is the time when um, we um, left everything aside and um, we have the opportunity also to look back to the past week and to thank God for all the blessings. The song said, count your many blessings. The Lord has blessed us. Let us be grateful for this.
Today we are going to continue our journey into the Sabbath School lessons. And if you remember, last Sabbath we were studying about Moses and the people of God. The title for the last Sabbath was The Covenant Broken. As people, many times we love to make promises. We make promises, and what happens many times with these promises? Sometimes we end up breaking them as soon as we promised. We promise, and as soon as we promised, we forget that. Just think about the time when you was a child. And um, I remember many times um, having two brothers, we always did a lot of mistakes. And especially when our parents weren't home because we would turn the house upside down. And our parents, they had a lot of patience with us. And they would tell us, don't do it again. They would teach us, this is not good what you did, but don't do it again. And what do you think we did? We were there promising, crying and promising. Yes, I promise I won't do that again. And what do you think happened as soon as our father or our mother would turn her sides away from us. We would do the same thing. And um, the same happens even with the children of God. Apostle Paul says that we are not fighting against principalities, but against evil powers. And we can see that even from the very beginning, God's children, Adam and Eve, they were fighting with Satan. They were fighting this fight of faith. And um, what we can learn from all this history, if we look back from Adam throughout the history all the way to us, we could understand that as long as our sight is pointing to Jesus, we are right. But as soon as we turn our sight away, we fail. We make promises to follow Christ. We are walking with Christ for a while. And as soon as we turn our sight away, we do mistakes and we break this covenant. But praise the Lord that um, in his mercy, in his grace, he is willing to restore this covenant with us. He's willing to give us more help, more grace, another opportunity to come back to him. And if we look to this experience of um, the people in the time of Moses, they made a promise. When um, Moses told them, informed them about the request of God, they said, yes, we will do everything. We will follow everything that the Lord has told us in uh, chapter 19 of Exodus. Yes, we will do. And then, what happened? They broke it. Today we are going to see how the Lord restores this covenant with them. Exodus chapter 34, 27, we read, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. At God's command, Moses has prepared two tables of stone, and has taken them with him to the summit, and again the Lord wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. What happened with the first stones? Because as we read here, we understand that this is another time when the Lord is writing his words of covenant. It's another time when he's writing on the tables of stones the Ten Commandments. What happened with the first stones? And um, in um, chapter 19, we see that the people are preparing to meet with God. They um, wash their clothes. They sanctify themselves. They even made bounds round about the um, mountain to make a distinction between holy and unholy. And then Moses and Joshua went up to the mountain to meet with God. In uh, chapter 31 of Exodus, we read that um, the Lord is giving Moses 
the tables of stones, and uh, these commandments were written on them by the finger of God. So keep that in mind that at this time, the Lord is giving Moses these tables of stones. And um, while uh, they were there, Joshua hears some noise from the camp. And at that time, he doesn't know how to interpret this um, noise. And he's coming to Moses, and uh, he's telling Moses, look, there is a noise of war in the camp. But Moses is answering him and says that it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Neither is the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. In other words, Joshua is coming to Moses and telling him, I think I hear some noise of war. But Moses is telling him, no, that's not a noise of war, but what I hear is actually a song. Probably they are happy, probably they are having a good time together. And um, Moses and Joshua are coming down from the mountain. As soon as he came night unto the camp, that he saw the calf and dancing. When Moses departed from them to go to meet with God, he left these people into the care of his brother, Aaron. What was the situation with these people when he left? It's the very same image that we started with. God's people, faithful people, making promise. Yes, we will follow everything that the Lord commanded us to. He left everything in perfect order. And just imagine, now coming, thinking that he's going to give them good news, the law of liberty. What did he see? His anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. What a feeling. When you left, you trusted everything into the person that you trust the most. And now you come back, everything is a mess. Moses takes these tables that the Lord gave him and he breaks them. The Lord wanted to make this covenant with them. But the people down there broke this covenant. And at this time, Moses is asking Aaron, what is happening here? Because he entrusted these people into his hand, into his care. What is happening here? What did Aaron say? He is trying to excuse himself and says, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are sad on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me. Then I cast into the fire, and their miracle there came out this calf. <laughs> you see that he is trying to give some color to this scene, putting these beautiful words together, saying that I did not do any wrong. I just asked. They gave me the gold. I threw it in the fire. And miracle, this happened. But in um, verse 5, says that he built it. He's not telling Moses, yes, I did build it. No. He's just saying, look, I just did that and that happened. But Moses took this calf and um, burnt it and um, threw it into the water and made the people drink from it. Imagine to, to drink water and also with um, that um, hot gold. To justify himself, Aaron endeavors to make the people responsible for his weakness in yielding to their demand. But notwithstanding this, they were filled with admiration for his gentleness and patience. But God sees not as man sees. Aaron's yielding spirit and his desire to please 
has blinded his eyes to the enormity of the crime he was sanctioning. His course in giving his influence to sin in Israel caused the life of thousands. Because Aaron did agree with um, the people's request, it caused the life of thousands. The Lord was very angry with Aaron, and Moses was praying for him. And um, it says here in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 323, if Aaron had had courage to stand for the right, irrespective of conscience, he could have prevented that apostasy. And at this time, after Moses rebuked enough his brother, what did he do? He made an appeal. What was this appeal about? Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Who is on the Lord's side? Make a decision today. You promised, you failed, and I'm asking you again, who is on the Lord's side? And the children of Levi came and sat next to him. And he said unto them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. 3,000 men that they promised, yes, we will follow what God promised. And even at this time, when Moses is asking, who is on the Lord's side? Who would like to be on the Lord's side? The children of Levi came. Among the others, of course, there were some who felt sorry for what did they do? But some of them, they did not. And these people were killed. And Moses said, Consecrate yourself today to the Lord, every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And um, many times we are thinking, why did God deal in such a way with these people? It was necessary that this sin should be punished as a testimony to surrounding nations of God's displeasure against idolatry. By executing justice upon the guilty, Moses, as God's instrument, must leave on record a solemn and public protest against their crime, as the Israelites should hereafter condemn the idolatry of the neighboring tribes, their enemies would throw back upon them the charge that the people who claim Jehovah as their God hath made a calf and worshipped it in Horeb. Just think about these people of Israel. They were to be a light in this world. They were to bring testimony to the people about God. And um, if God would have tolerated this um, sin that they did, worshipping idols, in a time when they would come to teach people, to do missionary work, to tell them, or to even rebuke them that what you are doing is not good, repent, what would the people say? Oh, don't you tell me what to do? Just think about your history. You were worshipping to this golden calf. And now you are coming to tell me not to worship my idols? And um, for that reason, God punished this sin. To be a testimony to the surrounding nations of God's displeasure against idolatry. And also to be a testimony for them, for the future nations, for the future generations. Because um, even today, we can see that when uh, someone is doing a mistake, we try to excuse ourselves pointing those people. As it was mentioned, there were also among them people who felt sorry for their sins. What did Moses communicate unto them? And um, in verse 30, it says that, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. That's true. You have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure, 
I shall make an atonement for your sin. What did Moses tell them? Yes, that's true. Understand that this sin was a great sin. But I will go unto the Lord and pray. And maybe he will have mercy upon you. Why do you think Moses said, yes, maybe the Lord will have mercy upon you? Moses didn't want them to feel that, okay, Moses is going to take care of it, and I don't have to worry about it anymore. So while uh, Moses was making um, his prayer for these people, the people also had to make this preparation. They were to pray God in their chambers. They were to make their personal confession to God and not to leave everything in Moses' hands. Because Moses was a human also. They were to pray God. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, these people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore, now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, my angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people, because they made the calf which Aaron made. What an interesting image here. Moses, the person, the leader that was mocked by the people for so many years while they were walking through the wilderness, he was mocked by these people, and now he is going to plead for them before God. And notice these verses, these words that he says, Oh, these people have sinned a great sin. I understand this. But please forgive their sin. And if you are not, please delete me from the book of life. The same mediation did even Jesus for us. When Adam and Eve had sinned, Jesus is going to the Father and telling him, remember that plan of salvation that we made? Let me go and die for them. Let me go and pay the price for their sins. And uh, we thank God because he accepted this. But now it's our turn, my dear friends, my dear brothers and sisters, to take advantage of this um, grace that God opened for us. Moses realized how dreadful would be the fate of the sinner. Yet, if the people of Israel were to be rejected by the Lord, he desired his name to be blotted out with theirs. He could not endure to see the judgment of God fall upon those who had been so graciously delivered. The intercession of Moses in behalf of Israel illustrates the mediation of Christ for sinful men. But the Lord did not permit Moses to bear, as did Christ, the guilt of the transgressor. Whosoever has sinned, Against me, he said, him will I blot out of my book. And Moses went and shared with the people what the Lord said. What do you think was the reaction of these people? Because they understood their sin. They understood that they did a mistake. And Moses promised them that he will pray for them. And uh, while Moses went to pray for them, they were at home also thinking about this confessing their sin, praying. And now they were probably waiting to see the response of the Lord. And what do you think it was their reaction? And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned. And no man did put on him his ornaments. They understood better the sin they did. They understood better what is the relationship between God and sin. They understood better that the sin cannot be in the presence of God. And uh, to understand that even better, what did Moses do? He took the tabernacle and uh, placed it outside of the camp. And uh, 
Just imagine to know that Moses, the leader, that he is always talking with God, he's away. He's out from among us. They understood that the presence of the Lord is not with them. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped, every man in his tent door. While they were struggling with this thought, what is going to happen next? The Lord has left us. What is going to happen next? They were following Moses, and they saw this blessing, that the Lord accepts the penitent. The Lord still had the grace for them. And it says that um, the people wept for joy, and they rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. More than that, the Lord is giving Moses an assurance, and he is telling him, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. I don't know if you ever experienced, even just for a few moments, to be without the presence of the Lord. When um, you know that um, you transgressed the law, when you know that you separated yourself from the Lord because of sin, it's not a good feeling. You feel guilty. And um, what is killing us more is not the pain, the physical pain, but the interior pain, the soul pain. When the soul is in pain, there is nothing that can save us but the presence of the Lord. He says that no earthly power or skill or learning can supply the place of God's abiding presence. When you feel like this, go to God like Moses and tell him like Moses did. Pray him like Moses did. What did Moses pray? I cannot lead these people unless thy presence shall go with me. Think about your company, if you are running a company. Go to God and tell him, I cannot run this without your presence. If you have a family, go to God and tell him, I cannot lead this family. I cannot take care of this family if your presence is not there. And even in your personal life, go to God and tell him, I cannot deal with myself if your presence is not present. Go to him and pray with Moses. Show me thy glory. What is this glory? The character of God. Let the soul in living faith fasten upon God. Let the tongue speak his praise. When you associate together, let the mind be reverently turned to the contemplation of eternal realities. Thus, you will be helping one another to be spiritually minded. When your will is in harmony with the divine will, you will be in harmony with one another. You will have Christ by your side as a counselor. So Moses was also praying, show me thy glory. And we saw that, um, what is this glory? It's about the character of God. And what is the answer uh, of this request, show me thy glory? I will make all goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. In the note we see that um, when Moses was praying to God, show me thy glory, the Lord did not rebuke him. God declared to his servant, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. It is sin that darkens our minds and dims our perceptions. As sin is purged from our hearts, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, illuminating his word and reflected from the face of nature, more and more fully will declare him merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. As we spend more time with him, as we let him take away 
our sinful heart, we are getting healed spiritually and we see his presence better. We are going to see his character better. We are going to understand his um, goodness better than before. Like, um, as you notice, um, I wear these glasses. And um, when I went to take this um, eye exam, I went because I could notice that um, my vision is a little bit blurry. Probably at that time I was um, blaming the lack of sleep, uh, provoking my vision to be blurry, but still I decided to go and take this exam. And as I was um, sitting there on the chair, the doctor brought, well, I don't know what machinery, and um, she was just working on those um, settings that she had there. And at one time I said, wow, I see so clear now. And then she said, yes, this is the vision with glasses. So when um, we are away from God, when um, uh, the Lord's presence is not in our hearts, we do not see sin in its image. As we come closer to God, we start seeing better and better. And when his presence is dwelling daily in our lives, we are going to see him better in his perfect image. And after Moses sees the glory of God, what did he pray for? If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for thine inheritance. And he said, Behold, I will make a covenant. Before all thy people I will do marvels. And now the Lord is um, renewing his covenant with, with these people that broke the previous covenant. Moses was full of confidence in God because he had appropriating faith. He needed help and he prayed for it, grasped it by faith. Moses did not merely think of God, he saw him. God was the constant vision before him. He never lost sight of his face. He saw Jesus as his savior, and he believed that the savior's merits would be imputed to him. This faith was to Moses no guesswork. It was a reality. This is the kind of faith we need, faith that will endure the test. May the Lord help us that while we meditate upon this story, that we may take a lesson, that we may understand that um, while we are looking towards Jesus, we can walk safely. As soon as we turn our sight from Jesus, we repeat the same experience of the people in the time of Moses. We are in danger of failing. So may the Lord help us and give us enough strength to be able to renounce, to be able to overcome everything that keeps us away from God, to overcome our human nature, our sinful heart, and um, to be able to come closer to him, to know him better, and um, spend the eternity together with him. This is my wish and prayer. Amen.
Jesus loves the little children? Yes. Okay, as we sing the song, let's put all the children around Jesus so they can feel his presence in their lives, okay?
trying. Bye, little boys. Now we're going to get ready to read a story, a couple of Sabbath school stories. So we're going to actually thank Jesus. And his friends and then his disciples and his mother they were, sad. They were so, so sad. sad and do you know where they put Jesus when he died on the tomb in the tomb and that's right today our lesson is called the resurrection let's listen it was early in the morning the sky was still dark it was the day after Sabbath. Mary Magdalene couldn't sleep, so she and her friends made their way to the garden where Jesus was buried. They brought spices along with them to anoint the body of Jesus. That so, was what they did. They, so, so the bugs have been biting. Maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. She said, without Jesus, my life will never be the same. She missed him so much. Mary Magdalene went early in the morning and she was crying and she kept thinking about her best friend, Jesus. Jesus changed her life. She was a sinner and when she accepted Jesus, she felt his love and his forgiveness. Then one of the women, Salome, remembered that there was a heavy stone in the entrance of the tomb. Who will roll it away, she asked, panic in a voice. We will never be able to move it. While the women worried about getting into the tomb in order to anoint his body, there was a great earthquake in the garden. The earth started to shake and angels came down from heaven and rolled the stone away and Jesus was called out my son my son arise arise and Jesus came out of the tomb but the women were still far away and they didn't see this happening the angel's face was shining bright with lightning and his clothes was brilliant and white. Now the guards and the soldiers were so afraid they fainted and fell on the ground when they saw. Fainted. fainted means that they, they lost their ability to keep their eyes open and to stand. They lost their balance and they fell. Mary Magdalene couldn't wait to get to Jesus' tomb. But when she got there, she was scared. Oh no, oh no. The stone had been rolled away. There's two angels. Oh no. 
no, someone has stolen the body of my friend, Jesus. His body is gone. I must hurry and go tell Peter and John. And Mary left the tomb sad. He's gone, he's gone, she cried. Then suddenly two angels appeared to the woman. So, he's gone, he is gone, they cried. Our Lord is gone. Suddenly, two angels appeared before the ladies, shining white. The woman could hardly look at them. They were terrified and they bowed low before the angels. Then one of the angels said, Who are you looking for? Jesus isn't here, he has resurrected. By God the Father, now go, tell the disciples in Galilee that Jesus has risen from the dead. Could this news be true? Could it be real that Jesus was alive? <coughs> what do you think? Yes, yes! They ran as fast as they could to tell the disciples. But Mary um, and Magdalene had already talked to Peter and John and said, they have taken my Lord away. And now when Peter didn't think Mary Magdalene knew what she was saying, whatever could she talk with? Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was anyone go. They couldn't believe them. Mary Magdalene was walking in the garden. Weeping and weeping, she returned to the tomb, still crying, and she saw two white-robed angels sitting at the head and the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been. Why are you crying, the angel said? Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where to find him. Mary glanced over her shoulders, and she saw someone standing behind her. Mary, Jesus said. Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have taken him away, please tell me where you have put him. Mary Magdalene couldn't wait to reach the tomb so she can be ahead of the others but, oh no, she cried in horror. The tomb was open. The stone was removed. She looked inside. He was gone. Someone has stolen the body of my friend, she sobbed. I must hurry and tell Peter and John. When the other, so she left the tomb crying. When the other two ladies were coming to the tomb, they hesitated. They saw that the tomb was opened. Then suddenly, two angels appeared before them and said, Who are you looking for? 
Why are you looking for Jesus? Jesus is in here. He has been resurrected. Wow. Resurrected? Could it be true? Could the angels be telling us the truth? The angels always tell us the truth. That's right. But they were unsure because Jesus was dead. Let's go tell Peter and John that he is alive. But now Mary Magdalene, remember, already went and told Peter and John that somebody had stolen the body of Jesus. And so now they, Mary Magdalene was on her way back to the tomb. And now these women went to go tell Peter what the angel said. But Peter was confused. Has somebody stolen his body or has, has he been resurrected? Now, Mary Magdalene was back in the garden. She was weeping and she was sobbing. She was so upset. And Peter and John also wanted to come to the tomb as well to see for themselves. John arrived first. He stopped and he looked inside the tomb and he saw how Jesus had folded his clothes neatly. They weren't messy. He left them nice and clean in the tomb. Until then, he didn't believe that Jesus was resurrected, but when he saw the nice, neat clothes, then he knew that this, in fact, Jesus was alive. Jesus was alive? And Mary Magdalene now was sitting with her head on her, in her hands, crying. And suddenly she saw two robed angels. Why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she said. Then suddenly she looked over and she heard a voice saying, Mary, thinking that it was the gardener, she said, Sir, have you taken my Lord from the tomb? Mary. Jesus again replied. Then she knew that it was her Savior, Jesus. He was alive. She fell at his feet and she exclaimed, Master, Master. I must tell the disciples. <coughs> I must tell my disciples, please. <clears throat> she fell at his feet and exclaimed, Master. Then he said, go, tell my disciples that I am alive and I am on my way to the one who is my father and their father too. Mary was no longer upset or sad. She was filled with joy. And she, saw, she shouted, he's alive. Can you say that? He's, he's alive. alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have seen him. I have seen him. He's alive. He's alive. Amen.